but let me just do a little brief introduction if you haven't been to a cafe for. Uh, I'm Bill Doley, the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. Uh, we're based down in Tucson. We're a private nonprofit organization, and we've been doing this uh, archaeology cafe here in Tucson, excuse me, in Phoenix for th two years, and six years down in Phoenix. That I-10 traffic was not so good today. <laughs> so yes, you know what I was trying to say. The idea of the cafe is an informal presentation, giving you an opportunity to hear the kind of, of involvement in an active research program that a uh, person who's very deeply committed to what they're doing is uh, and cares very much about, and, and getting that feel for what excites them and giving you an opportunity to, in this informal context, ask questions. So without further ado, uh, Kate Spielman will be talking about the Agua Fria and particularly the interesting concept of art, agave as artifact. Kate. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Bill and to Linda for inviting me to do an archaeology cafe. And thank you to all of you who have shown up to listen to something dreadful. OK, phew. Um, I've never been miked before, so we'll see how this goes. Anyway, uh, how many of you have been to Perry Mesa? OK, whoa, this is great. All right, well, then you'll know. So the first hand, part of the handout, the very first page, was in order to get the rest of you there so that you understand where it is uh, in Arizona. So um, the picture on the left-hand side of your handout is Agua Fria National Monument, which covers much of Perry Mesa. And the other portion of Perry Mesa is covered by uh, Tonto National Forest. So if you haven't been there, what you do is drive up I-17 and take the Bloody Basin exit. Um, you'll need a high clearance vehicle, and don't drive up there when it's been raining because you just won't come back. Um, it's way, way too, uh, too muddy. So once up there, just to give you a little bit of uh, prehistoric background or pre-contact background of the Perry Mesa landscape before we get into the topics for tonight, once up there, what you would see if you um, drove around on the uh, somewhat challenging roads is a series of large archaeological sites. And by large, I mean sites that have about 100 to 150 rooms. Um, and they're surrounded by a series of smaller sites. So what we have are a series of clusters of communities with one major site anchoring a series of um, smaller habitation sites. And these represent um, the result of a fairly sizable migration onto Perry Mesa in the late 1200s and early 1300s. So, um, so there's a real community up there and that larger community on Perry Mesa, which probably had between 2,500 and 3,000 people, is divided into a series of smaller communities, each of which had several hundred people. Um, before the late 1200s, there were some smaller habitations up there, and that's something that Scott Wood and David Abbott are, are, are uh, doing some research on right now. So it's not like there was nobody up there, but there were relatively few people, and then there's this pulse of occupation, uh, pulse of migration onto Perry Mason in the late 1200s, early 1300s. People are there till the early 1400s, and then they leave. So that's sort of Perry Mason prehistory in a nutshell. Now, there are two um, topics that I'm going to uh, elaborate on tonight. I was allowed to have two because I wanted to talk about Perry Mesa, and there's just a lot to talk about. So uh, I picked two. And one is, uh, is agave an artifact? So we'll start out with that. And then we'll talk about uh, making culture, so ethnogenesis, making culture on Perry Mesa in the 1300s. Because uh, some very interesting cultural things happened on Perry Mesa in the 1300s that really haven't been recognized. And, and work by a variety of people from uh, ASU and our collaborators um, at BLM and uh, at the, parks, uh, the Forest Service um, has sort of illuminated what went on in Perry Mesa in, in this 14th century period. OK, so that's where we're going. And um, so the question period, you're welcome to answer questions as I'm going along. But at the end of the agave one, we'll have a chance for some questions. And then the, at the end of the culture making, we'll have some questions as well. So what is an artifact? Yeah. Um, it's any 
anything made or modified by man and um, it's the ground. So. Okay, the ground doesn't even matter. Okay. So, so you have basically quoted Sarah Nicias's textbook. That's really good. Uh, so an artifact is, I, I, I looked it up because I thought, okay, what are people being told an artifact is? And, and that's exactly it. So we're going to put these, those two words up there. And we're going to, so made or modified by humans. And so the question of whether agave is an artifact revolves around whether the agave that we're finding on Peri Mesa were modified or in effect made, domesticated, by humans. And so the first part of this, uh, this journey, this is agave, uh, an artifact, has been uh, immensely uh, facilitated and uh, enlightened by two of our collaborators from the Desert Botanical Garden who are here today, Wendy Hodgson and Andrew Salawan. One of the questions that ASU had going into our work on, on Perry Mesa is whether there were legacies of this prehistoric human occupation on that landscape that endured today. And agave um, potentially gave us one sort of legacy. So in 2005, um, we, we contacted Wendy, who was really, really helpful in getting the seminar going. And she said, you know, um, those agave up on Perry Mesa look to me as if they could be hybrids. So there are two uh, wild species. So, so this is the modification part. We began our research on agave on Perry Mesa with a, a modification hypothesis. Do we have uh, a hybrid of chrysantha agave chrysantha and agave perii. And, um, and she said one way that the students could help us figure that out is by taking a series of measurements on the agave. And so I have my portable agave here to show you, and I'm supposed to hold it up for the camera, this is the agave, um, provided by my botanical friends at the Desert Botanical Garden, and uh, I'm going to show you how we measured uh, the agave. I have to caution you, so the agaves that we measured were basically this tall. We measured 410 of them. Um, and I do not encourage you to do this at home because we shed a lot of blood for science uh, in 2005. These, these are very, very sharp, these pointy spots here. So if I can just put this down for a second. So uh, a diagnostic measurement is a ratio between the length of the width of the, um, the leaf. So the students were took the tape measures and took the length measurement of the leaf. And then the really tricky part is getting down in the agave, which is full of very pokey spines, and taking a width measurement way down at the bottom. So that's what we did, a series of four archaeological sites. We had the length which, width measurements, and when we plotted them out, we had the length width ratio for chrysantha, we had the length, which is sort of tall, long, narrow leaves, length width ratio for perii, which is sort of short and fat, and our leaf measurements throughout across all of these four sites were right in between. So that kept the hypothesis alive. It didn't demonstrate that they were hybrids, but it sort of kept that hypothesis alive. So, so modification seemed like a possibility. Um, and then, then we went on and did a bunch of archaeology. So in, um, in 2013, we had another field seminar, contacted Wendy again. Andrew Salawan had come on board, a geneticist, a botanical geneticist. And, um, and we talked about a different form of modification on the landscape. We said, OK, we measured lots of agave around archaeological sites. Um, up on Perry Mesa, but are they localized to archaeological sites? Do people just plant agaves around the sites, or agaves actually all over the Perry Mesa landscape, and, and we just haven't bothered to look? So that's what your next page is all about. OK, so essentially across the uh, width of this um, these pictures that, that you're looking at, we, we did a survey of the Mesa south of Baby Canyon. Uh, and we talked with Andrew and Wendy and said, OK, so what plants uh, do you think could be sort of uh, planted by humans, so, quote unquote wild plants? And they said, well, like code for yucca, 
code for agave, obviously, and code for bear grass. And what you have on here is the distribution of yucca, which is in green, and I'm sorry, agave, which is in green, and yucca, which is in yellow. And what's quite interesting is that the agave is highly localized to the large archaeological sites um, that are on that landscape. And once you get away from those archaeological sites, then uh, it, you, you get into sort of yucca territory. There's not that much bear grass around there. Now, uh, now there's a ca caveat. So again, this is not a slam dunk. Um, it's, we felt that we, so agave like very rocky areas and uh, toward the edge of the uh, canyon, which is what we have up here where all the green is, there's a lot of broken up rock. Our sense was that we passed a lot of broken up rock on our surveys that did not have agave. But in order, again, to to uh, get to this modification in terms of placement on the landscape hypothesis, we would need to do some more analysis of the landscape and say, okay, really, there are very rocky areas that look just like where we're finding agave and there aren't agave. But again, right now, that hypothesis is alive that people planted agave in fields around archaeological sites in order to ultimately consume the heart, and that the location of the agave, so first we were looking at hybrids, now we're looking at location, the location of the agave is also a human um, creation, that that modification is a human creation. In the meantime, um, between 2005 and 2013, Wendy had been doing a lot of research on domesticated agave elsewhere in central Arizona. And she had um, mentioned, or she and Andrew got together, and she said, you know, those Perry Mesa agave look a lot like domesticated agave I'm finding at Page Springs, right? Is it Page Springs? Um, a little to the north? Of, of where Perry Mesa is. And so Andrew's a geneticist, and he, uh, he ran a couple of samples. And in fact, genetically, the agave on Perry Mesa are not chrysantha or peri. Uh, can you say they're domesticates, or we just know that they're something different? Mm. OK, so, so, but this is where we're moving from modified, how humans modified agave that were on the Perry Mesa landscape by hybridizing them, by moving them on the landscape, or were they not on Perry Mesa before people got there and they were brought up and planted by the immigrants that I was mentioning uh, in the late 1200s and early 1300s. So the whole picture of agave manipulation or agave presence on that landscape uh, changes with this uh, genetic hint. Now, thanks to the funding from the BLM, um, and the BLM has funded us throughout, uh, beginning in 2004, spring 2004 when we began, um, the Desert Botanical Garden will be able to undertake uh, further genetic analyses of the agave from Perry Mesa. So, so this is a sort of stay tuned, but this is a really new development in terms of our understanding of agave on that landscape. So I want to talk about two other uh, dimensions. Uh, now that we're thinking about agave um, on Perry Mesa as something that was introduced rather than manipulated when people arrive there. And one is that if they're introducing, so this is Murphy, oh, this is not the same thing as that, but it's the small one that I had. Um, so agave is not hard to transport. If, it, if you're carrying around one of these little pups or these little bulbules, you know, a small plant, you can put a bunch in a, um, in, in, a, in a sock, and they can travel for a while without being watered or without being in dirt. Um, but as you know, when, when you think, so agave is harvested uh, just before the inflorescence comes up. So when you've got you know, a really mature, sizable agave, but you don't want it, it to flower because that's eating up all the, the energy in the heart. Um, so between putting something like this in the ground and when you get to the point that you can harvest the heart to get the food from the plant that you've put in the ground, um, you know, you're looking at 10 or 12 years. And so, so what we begin to imagine is that people are planning that migration to the Perry Mesa landscape. If, if agave are an important part of your um, subsistence, and, and we think they probably are up on Perry Mesa, then in order to make it possible to harvest agave on a regular basis, you really have to get them established up there early. And so um, that makes the early 1200s you know, smaller sites that are, are kind of scattered around the southern part of Perry 
Mesa, uh, even more interesting because it looks essentially like sort of potential pioneers um, who then established land rights, established a knowledge of that landscape, and, um, and, and begin the, the uh, agave fields. And then once they're up there, they're also planting corn and, and the other sorts of foods that we expect uh, from the Southwest. So, so it, it, it changes our, our uh, perception of, of prehistory on, on that, that landscape. The other thing, uh, the final point that I want to make with regard to agave is, is that the, the larger point I'm trying to make is that landscapes that look natural um, because they have arid plants on them across the southwest in many, many cases are actually modified. They're, they're the remains of uh, human activities centuries ago um, that are hard to detect. So when I was thinking about how to make this point, I was thinking that, that citrus might be a reasonable um, parallel with, with what we're seeing with agave up to a point. So we've brought citrus to the valley and we brought them here because we eat the citrus and they grow well in the sunshine as long as we water them. Um, and obviously when we cease watering, you know, when they're going to develop the land or something, then, then the citrus die. But, but the, the citrus are an artifact. They're a domesticated plant, a perennial plant, and we put them here. They did not originate here in the Phoenix Basin. Well, it, it's the same potentially with the agave that we have on Perry Mesa. They weren't there. People brought them there. They're an arid land plant, so they could last after the people left and stop sort of manipulating them. Um, but in fact, they're as if citrus was left behind by people in the Phoenix Basin and, and, and was just here. So, um, so when you're looking at southwestern landscapes, um, it's a good idea not to think about natural and cultural, but to sort of understand there is a legacy of prehistoric cultural activity on those landscapes that we're just beginning to, to understand. Any questions about that first part? Yeah. No. How does it figure in? Yeah, agave murphii, the same plant that you can buy at Lowe's or Home Depot, it actually has a great story too. It's one of our five domesticates, pre-Columbian domesticates. And this one, we think originated in northwestern uh, Sonora, much more dry, hotter climate. And it gets hit with frost. So you see Murphy, our remnant populations today out like at Lake Pleasant, uh, Tunnel Basin, which we don't find it further north at higher elevations because they freeze out. But we think that they were grown extensively uh, all the way from at least Lake Pleasant into uh, northern Sonora and the more deserty, really arid regions of, of the Sonoran Desert. So it's very different from from these other agaves. And it, it is a, a domesticate. Yeah. And then perii is not. Perii is, is a, a wild agave. Yeah. Um, so um, the hypothesis has not been proved or disproved. Is that what you're saying? Right. So, so I, I, I'm leaving you sort of la 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 la. Um, OK, so, so we, we think we've moved somewhat beyond modified um, in that Rather than being a hybrid, uh, it appears that the agave, a hybrid of two wild species, it appears that the agave on Perry Mesa may be domesticate. And that's why I would put it in the made. A domesticated plant is created by humans manipulating it genetically. Um, the, uh, the modification that continues, the picture of the modification story, is the planting around the sites. Um, and, and that means that the, where the agave are found on Perry Mesa doesn't have to do with some sort of natural processes. It has to do with where people put them 700 years ago. Yeah? When you're going into the idea of modification, what effect do the rock piles have? That was obviously man-made, planting them in rock piles. Does that make them a little better? Right. Faster? Uh, okay, yeah. So, so, so the question is, when you're looking at modification, people have modified the landscape around the around what were their village sites in order to enhance agave productivity. And, and by creating these rock piles, you're creating a microclimate. So, um, so they concentrate moisture. Um, so when the sun is beating down, you've got these rocks that are, are still holding more moisture than the rest of the landscape. And it's a tiny little rise above any sort of cold air drainage. And so, so even though it's a 
very modest elevation, you're a little bit above where the coldest air is going to be. So, so it creates these microclimates in terms of moisture and temperature that enhance um, the uh, survivability of the agave. Yeah? Up there? Well, so what we, we think that instead of being hybrids, they're actually a completely different species. So, so, so we began with a hybridization hypothesis. Our measurements suggested that that might, might be correct because the length-width ratios were in between. Um, but the genetic data suggests that it's actually a completely different species and potentially a domestica. And that, that we're continuing, uh, again, with BLM's support to um, uh, to investigate this year. Yeah. Okay. They went through all the trouble to plant all these plants there. What percentage of this was their food supply? Um, how much do they rely on it? Right. That's, that's an excellent question, and it's really, really hard to, um, <clears throat> to answer. So uh, if, if we had bone chemistry data, I mean, if we had some sort of data that was directly gave us information on um, the proportion of corn in the diet, that, that might help us. So we know that they grew corn, we know that they grew agave. Um, in the Tano Basin, I, I worked on the uh, uh, Tano Basin project back in, in the 90s, we estimated potentially 50-50. Um, well, not, I mean, obviously there are other things, little barley and stuff, but, but a, a sort of an equal contribution to the diet. And, and something along those lines, but boy, I would not go into battle on that. Um, but, but it's an important source of carbohydrate. The, uh, when you, I don't know if you've had any pick baked agave. I know the Botanical Garden does this. Some other places do it periodically. But it, it's like eating smoky fudge. It's really sweet, dense carbohydrate. Um, so once you've got it going, it could be a reasonable source. Um, and, and corn, uh, it, it would be a really good supplement to corn. But I, I don't know what the proportions are. Well, we just don't have data to be able to evaluate that. Yeah. What is the growth period of agave in, in a time frame? How fast can they harvest and, and retrieve agave um, there? Do we know it? Yeah, so, so you look, I mean, roughly you're looking at 10 or 12 years. So, so if you're establishing a field, what you're wanting to do is get new pups or whatever, new small ones in. Um, on, on a cycle, so, so that you've got so the earliest ones you planted are maturing, and then the next, and then the next, and the next. Now, now you can, um, you can store, so, so, so once you've pit baked agave, you can make cakes out of it um, and dry it. And so, so it is possible to store for, uh, for not, not forever, but at least, you know, for some period of time. Yeah. Good question. So in 2007, we had, um, we had another, an undergraduate student who uh, beat the heck out of um, soaked agave leaves in order to extract the fiber. And her, her question was, is Chrysantha or Perii more productive of fiber? Um, and, and so it's fiber. Um, would be your other, so, so, so leaves, uh, if you macerate them, if you say soak them in water and then uh, use a scraper or something like that to, to get the, the pulp off, then, then you're left with fibers that can be woven, you know, into garments or sandals or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. How many roasting pits have you found? There are, there are a number. Our, um, we haven't done a lot of survey ourselves out, out on the, the landscape, but there are roasting pits. Uh, and there are also rock piles. In, in the, the Charlotte Hall Museum, there's actually a very interesting photograph from a, a Yavapai roasting pile. So if you've been to Perry Mesa, you know that it's basically basalt. And then the whole idea in most of it of, of digging a pit is, is a pretty big challenge. Um, but you can create the same effect, that, that rock heating oven, by, uh, by creating a large pile of rocks uh, as opposed to a big pit. So, so we probably have both out there uh, on that, that landscape. Oh, 
<laughs> these, these are, are definitely needles. So uh, the point that there was being made is that there are a variety of ways of processing. What, 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 she, what the student found was that if you soak, it's just less labor. But, but you certainly can pound um, between you know, an anvil and, and a rock hammer. OK? We good on, on the agave part? These are all great questions. And, uh, and we're eagerly anticipating the, the information on, on the genetics of the agave up there. But it, it, if we're thinking about agave as an artifact, if it turns out that agave is the same as the Page Springs agave, then the kinds of questions that we ask about archaeological uh, the, the more typical artifacts, stone tools and pots and so on, and, and exchange, we can begin to think about in terms of plants. Uh, what is the distribution of different kinds of domesticates, different kinds of domesticated agave uh, across uh, central Arizona? So, um, so the sorts of social questions that we ask of artifacts uh, can also be asked of agave. Okay, well we're going to move on to um, making culture. So. When you think of um, archaeological cultures uh, across the Southwest, when you're visiting national monuments or you're um, talking to friends or taking classes or whatever, taking visitors places, what are some archaeological cultures that, that come to mind? What, what archaeological cultures are prominent in, in Southwestern prehistory? None. There are none. I'm sorry? The whole, com yes, okay. Right, we're like in whole com central. <laughs> okay, and, and what, what is distinctive? What are some distinctive things about the whole com archaeological record? Ball courts? Red on buff pottery. Shell work. Canals. Platform mounds. Okay, let's get another culture. So is the whole comet, are you so whole com centric? <laughs> Membrace. Membrace, okay, what's distinctive about membranes? Okay. So the pottery, pit house structures, another place. Okay, and, and okay, well, I'm thinking, say, Chaco. People think about Chaco. Well, what's distinctive about when you think about Chaco? Great houses, right. So a lot of, not everything, but a lot of what you've mentioned either has to do with decorated ceramics or um, ritual architecture. So ball courts, platform mounds, great houses, some of the oversized pit structures in, in the Membrace area. Um, these are all distinctive aspects of cultural practice in the past across the U.S. Southwest. And um, probably when you were sitting there thinking and going, boy, I hope somebody else answers that question. Because I, I, you know, I teach. I just wait till people answer the question. <laughs> I can wait you out. <laughs> um, but Central Arizona probably didn't cross your mind. You know, there, it doesn't have the decorated pottery. And, and it, it apparently, you know, may not have any distinctive ritual architecture. And so you've got these famous cultural areas or, or ritual practices um, across the Southwest, but they seem to uh, bypass Central Arizona. And so one of the um, outcomes of our now 10 years of, of uh, research up at Perry Mesa is the realization that there was very much the development of, of a culture <coughs> on Perry Mesa in the 1300s. And so that's what I'm going to talk about right now, a development in terms of ritual architecture and also, interestingly, a development in terms of ceramics. But it's not going to be what uh, the sort of decorated ceramics that, that you might expect. So, um, oh, the first thing before we get into the ritual architecture, this uh, picture of um, ridges, so, so that this page on your handout is a picture of um, agricultural fields at Perry Mesa. So Melissa Cruz Peoples just completed a dissertation on agricultural production on Perry Mesa. One of the other modifications, so, so these are fields for growing corn and beans and squash, stuff like that. 
One of the other modifications on Perry Mesa is acres and acres and acres of these agricultural fields. So people were putting a lot of effort into agriculture and they were being successful about it. And, and just to give you a sense of the transformation of the landscape by people, um, I wanted you to see that aerial photo. Okay, but let's turn to the next one. So in, um, early on in our work on Perry Mesa, there's an undergraduate student who was involved in our project named Will Russell. Uh, he's now a graduate student at ASU. And he had uh, been collecting data on what appeared to be racetracks uh, in central Arizona. And over the course of this data collection, those racetracks really seem to be concentrated on Perry Mesa. In fact, they are largely concentrated on Perry Mesa. So the two uh, pictures on your handout, uh, one is of the racetrack complex, and I'll describe what that is because it's not simply a race, just a track in the ground. Uh, and then the other is a picture showing you where the racetracks are concentrated. Um, and, and you can see by and large they're on Perry Mesa, one over in Bloody Basin and one over in Polis. Okay, so, so the racetrack complex is, um, replicated, so it is a, a ritual complex parallel to ball courts and kivas and platform mounds and so on. It is a complex that includes a racetrack um, that can go from 100 to 400 feet or more. Uh, there's a plaza either at the end or over on the side, a formal cleared plaza. There are uh, food processing debris, um, and so you've got little uh, images for manos and uh, agave knives and so on along that map. Um, and there's a roasting pit. So somebody asked about roasting pits. There's a roasting pit associated with each of these racetracks. And then often some rock feature, a rock pile or some boulders or whatever. So, so the, this complex, this is what Wills has documented, published in Kiva in 2010, um, documented a very clear set of features that go along with, uh, with racing on, uh, on Perry Mesa. And so his, his argument, and then uh, what he's also found over time, he, there are about 50 um, potential racetracks. He's uh, ground truth 27 of them. And as you can see on that map on the right side of your page, uh, the vast majority of them are in Perry Mesa. So the racetrack complex, that, that ritual complex, is very much a Perry Mesa phenomenon. Uh, but as I say, you know, a few other places that it shows up, but really it's P Perry Mesa is it. Perry Mesa is where this complex develops and, and, and then fluoresces. So the argument that um, Will made was that if we're getting a series of immigrants from central Arizona, which it appears to be where they're coming from, maybe the Prescott area, the Flagstaff area, and so on, they're coming onto this new landscape. Um, they leave their other ritual practices behind. Okay, so they come from places with kivas. There are no kivas on Perry Mesa. They come from places with ball courts, Wapaki. No ball courts on Perry Mesa. They come from places um, with those large rectangular rooms like in Eldon Pueblo. No large rectangular rooms on Perry Mesa. So, so all of the, that distinctive uh, regional um, ritual practice is left behind. And Will's argument was that, uh, that they're agreeing on elaborating a practice that every known culture across the Southwest uh, employs, and that is racing. So, so racing is a component of Odom practice, it's a component of Puebloan practice uh, across you know, the various um, Pueblo populations. And um, uh, often in, in association with the celestial events, the solstices, equinoxes, and so on. But, but, but his thought was, boy, if you're getting a bunch of people, if you're just gonna agree to live on this landscape and you're not you know, really in a position to kind of convert people to whatever you were doing before, you can agree on a practice that you then elaborate that everybody is familiar with, that everybody um, uh, can embrace. Uh, and the other component of it, so there's racing and then there's feasting. And obviously, you know, every culture that, that we know about uh, has feasting as part of its ritual practices. So those two components um, become definitive of ritual in Perry Mesa. It's not that they're bereft of ritual, they have their own, it's distinct from anything else that we know in the Southwest.
Okay, so, so the racing uh, model sets up a, a hypothesis that, that we have a really tightly knit community on Perry Mesa. And then David Abbott and two of his students, if we go back to the first page, um, Chris Watkins and Sophie Kelly did uh, a, uh, quite a, an intensive um, petrographic analysis of ceramics on Perry Mesa and were able, uh, on and off, it, it actually went over into the Verde Valley, um, so it was quite, they were looking at ceramics from a very wide area. And what they documented was that on Perry Mesa, 95% of the uh, plainware pottery, and that's basically what's up there, was made on Perry Mesa. So, so Perry Mesa is, um, is very much a community. Not only are they making uh, virtually all of the pottery that they use up there, but the um, clusters over on the east side of the Mesa, so Rosalie, Brooklyn, especially Rosalie and Brooklyn, are sending pottery over to the west side of the mesa. So um, Pato and uh, so it's up in Silver Creek is, is where La Plata is. Rich and Bar is over on Black Mesa, and Pato is in the um, Perry Tank area. So so not only are they consuming their own pottery, but when they're trading their pottery, it's all staying on the mesa. So 80% of the plainware pottery at La Plata is coming from the eastern side of the mesa, and then 30% of what's over at Rich and Bar and Pato is coming from the mesa. So, so this sort of reinforces the sociality of uh, interaction on Perry Mesa. Pottery production, pottery exchange, not much going out, not much coming in um, on, on, on the mesa. So in order to understand this, so let's go to the last page here. So on the last page, you have uh, a picture of plainware vessels. These are actually Holcomb plainwares. It's the slide that Dave Abbott uses to illustrate plainwares. So the ceramic um, tradition across central Arizona, including Perry Mesa, is one of plainwares. No decorations. You have local clays, local tempers, and the only thing that people do to that plain wear if they want to sort of jazz it up a bit is put a red slip on it. But it's simply not decorated. So to understand culture making on Perry Mesa, what, um, what I find helpful is to move out from Perry Mesa and say what is going out on around it that might have led to this expression, this cultural development on Perry Mesa itself. So, um, and where this is coming from is there are a variety of social anthropologists, Frederick Barth and uh, Brian Foster and, and other people who say, okay, people express ethnicity uh, when they're in the context of other cultures who are also expressing a very firm identity. So, so you sort of ramp up your expressions of identity in the context of other people around you who are doing the same thing. And I think that's what's happening on Perry Mesa. So, so the really beautiful pots that you see uh, on the rest of the slide are being made uh, to the north. So you've got Jedito yellowware, so you've got the Hopi yellowware um, being made to the north. You've got Salala polychrome uh, developing to the east of Perry Mesa, White Mountain redware to the east. So you have a whole series of, of different populations that are really um, investing in decorating their pots. And Perry Mesa is having none of it. So let's think about why. Would you, so, so do you know what's happening ritually in the 1300s? If people talked with you about you, Kachina cult, Southwestern cult. Um, so there are a series of ritual developments that again are happening around Perry Mesa. So you've got the Kachina cult developing up in the Hopi area. You've got um, the Southwestern cult that Patty Crown is associated with Salado Polychrome. Um, so you have ritual developments that are happening around Perry Mesa that involve decorated pottery. That pottery hardly comes onto Perry Mesa at all. So Perry Mesa knows about it. A little bit of Salado Polychrome, a little bit of Jedito Yellow is being imported in. Um, kind of like gifts. You know, maybe you make a trip to Hopi and, and you bring back a pot. Or maybe somebody comes to one of your races and they bring a pot. 
but, but Perry Mesa isn't really at all interested in decorated pottery. And they're not at all interested in the cults that go along with, with uh, the decorated pottery. Um, so what they seem to be doing, rather than, than being agnostic, <laughs> is, is developing their own ritual system that has meaning to them um, and that is, uh, is an important part of their lives. And they're not participating in these larger scale things that are going on around them. So, so we don't want to think of Perry Mesa in isolation. Oh, here they are, and they've got their racetracks, and they've got their plainware pottery. Um, they really are in tune with what's going on in the rest of um, their area in the Southwest, but they are, they're rejecting it. They're, they simply are not participating the way other uh, populations become, buy into the Kachina cult, buy into the Southwestern cult, make Salado polychrome, import Jedito yellowware, uh, and so on. Okay, so why do you think that they wouldn't uh, decorate their pots? I mean, it's okay, so you don't have to make a salado polychrome or a jetido, but, but why aren't they decorating their pots at all? Could it be that they don't have clan systems? I'm sorry? Could it be that they do not have clan systems? And, and so, so the iconography, okay, so, so, so the iconography that might be going on the other pots, the decorated ones, might not be relevant to Perry Mesa? Okay, well, about other thoughts? Yeah? Life was so difficult on Perry Mesa, just survival took a lot of time, and so decoration took more time. It could be, so, so, so it certainly is more efficient to make a pot that's not decorated. Um, we don't, and you know, it's an open question whether it was so difficult, you know, it might have been, might not have been. So it's something to remember and something that I don't have expertise in is that there's a lot of rock art on Perry Mesa. So, um, so yeah, if you haven't been up there, then, then you don't know that. So there is time to create iconography. It's not like iconography is a bad thing. Um, but putting it on pots is inappropriate. Right. Okay. So, so what's motivating um, the, the iconography on the, the vessels that, that are just fluorescing around Perry Mesa um, may could have created more divisions than, than creating some sort of commonality. Um, that's certainly the case. So, so, so we have a situation. There is no answer, but iconography may not be appropriate. Um, in, in the way that you're talking about, uh, it may not be necessary to put icons on pots. So somebody I think you've heard speak before, Barbara Mills, um, has talked about uh, the uh, importance of external designs on pots signaling sort of your participation in the group, that this is your way of saying, okay, I, I'm part of the Kachina cult. I'm participating in the Southwestern cult. I'm, I'm one of you people. Um, and we're, when we're talking about a relatively small population that knows each other really well, 2,000, 3,000 people up on Perry Mesa, that kind of signaling of belonging simply may not be to the point. Um, they're, they're not the same sort of multi-ethnic populations that say the, the Kanta are creating or, or encountering in their, their migrations or that the Hopi are encountering up on Hopi mesas. So there are a whole variety of reasons and they all may come together. Iconography may be inappropriate for pots. Iconography may create tr uh, tradition, um, divisions among uh, diverse peoples or iconography just may not be necessary because you already know you're part of this uh, racetrack ritual system. What's interesting, so, so we know the Southwestern cult expands. I, I work it, as, as um, Bill mentioned, in, in the Salinas area. We get a version of it in the Rio Grande. We know the Kachina cult expands. So these really took off in the Southwest in the way that the um, uh, racetrack system did not. Uh, and Perry Mesa is uh, abandoned residentially uh, in the early 1400s, becomes part of the great migration um, across much of the Southwest that ends up mostly at Hopi, Zuni, Acoma, and a little bit in the Rio Grande. But it's sort of interesting, um, one of the, uh, in terms of this, this migration, uh, one of the 
arguments that the Hopi make about reasons that they accept people onto the Hopi mesas, the gathering of the clans, is that they bring specific powerful rituals. And so one of the things I wonder about, I have no information, but I kind of wonder about, is whether the Perry Mesa people, whether there's something in this racetrack complex uh, that, that then contributes later on to, uh, to some of the rituals that, um, that we see today. So that's sort of the overview of culture making. I know it's, there are a lot of moving parts in it, but um, I'm glad, happy to uh, answer questions that you might have. Yeah. Concerning pottery, okay, you have to have clay sources. Have any clay um, beds been found or any sources for, for the... Uh, the yes, yes, so, so the, the pottery is made there. There, the, there are clay sources and, and they've been, um, chemically you know, identified, so the clay that is in the pottery is the clay that's local to Perry Mesa, uh, and, and the temper, the same. So, so the materials to make pottery, if you wanted to decorate a pot, you could have done it on Perry Mesa, um, but, but they have all the raw materials there, yeah. I'm a little confused about what you mean by the racing tracks, like, like game racing, is that what you're talking about, or are you talking about a different kind of racing? So racing in, in, in the Pueblo world is, is, a, is a ritual act. So, so it, it's not, you know, like in the Olympics, we're watching people race. They're doing it on skates now, and in the summer we'll see it on the, on the tracks. But, but this, is, um, this is an act. In a sense, it's a, the way Will talks about it, a form of sacrifice. It's your effort, your energy, um, and by expending that, you're, in some cases, helping the sun cross over, or, or you're doing something else that is good for the larger world. So, so when you're racing, it's less about, uh, it's not a competition, it's, it's a ritual act. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you consider the people then, ancestral Pueblo people that were at Prairie Mesa as opposed to the Holocaust? Yeah, yes. Uh, um, they, so, so they're, they're making, uh, the, the architecture on Perry Mesa is masonry above ground, you know, Puebloan architecture. Um, as I mentioned, they, they, they lack some of the attributes like kivas, you know, that you might normally think of with Pueblos, but there are reasons for that uh, and, and why they're, they're focusing on the racing complex. Yeah, no buff, yeah, it seems to be, they're earlier, so Perry Mesa has a whole com period of occupation. There are pit houses up there, but then there's this break and, um, and, and you get what looks more like a Puebloan occupation. Some people say that it was very, very defensive, Perry Mesa, very much a defensive area. Right, so, so Dave, Dave Wilcox has argued that, um, that Perry Mesa is, was essentially a fort, you know, so a, a castle, he calls it a castle defense. And, and there are clearly areas, so, so Las Mujeres on your, um, on your first map over to the lower right-hand corner, um, you have a, a, a community called Las Mujeres, and that, that Pueblo is, is, you know, it's got a wall around it and it's right on a cliff. Um, so, so there are more defensive looking communities in Perry Mesa and there are less defensive co communities at Perry Mesa. We don't have evidence of burning. Um, we have a lot of evidence of trade, so the landscape doesn't look terribly hostile. And one of the things that uh, Melissa Cruz pointed out in, in a 2007 publication in Kiva is that the Pueblos are, so what Davis said is, okay, Pueblos are, are at the edges of the mesas because those are defensible. And, and Melissa pointed out is that, well, the Pueblos are at the edges of the mesas because that's where the water is. So if you're in the middle of the mesa, you know, you're sort of out of luck in terms of water. So I think, it, Remember, the late 1200s, early 1300s is a period of a lot of migration. There's a lot of social flux across um, the southwestern landscape. It wouldn't surprise me if people are concerned and, it, and take some, some efforts at defense. Um, but we don't, I, I don't have a sense from our work up there that it's like hunkering down. And also, something else to remember, so, so this picture of the fields, so um, I think it's your third part of the handout here, enormous portions of the Perry Mesa landscape are, are open and modified for agricultural production. And we know where warfare is endemic, as it was, say, among the Iroquois in the eastern United States, you simply can't be that extensive for agriculture. You really have to farm close to your, your settlements. Yeah. You mentioned there's a lot of rock art up there. Does that give you any clue to some of these questions? Um, in terms of where they came from, or, or? Well, uh, that, or there's nothing on the pots. Did they put it on the walls up there instead? Or so, 
we haven't really analyzed, we've recorded, so um, Arlen Simon, who's a, a, a faculty member at ASU, again with uh, BLM funding, has recorded a lot of the rock art up there. Um, but how, we, we don't have sort of a large analysis of how it compares with rock art elsewhere in the Southwest. There is a, a, a interesting distinctions. The uh, rock art near La Plata is different than the rock art uh, further south on the Mesa. So, so some of the social distinctions that Will was thinking about in, in, his, um, these, in his paper um, do seem to play out in the rock art. More geometric in the north, more um, uh, animals and anthropomorphs in the south. Yeah, so, well, that's a whole nother. <laughs> okay, so topic three, why did they move to Perry Mesa? Um, Perry, at the time, so we have a whole uh, research project around that question. And um, at the time, during the, the drought of the late 1200s, Perry Mesa was one of the least affected. So um, it, it was a logical place to move. And in the early 1300s, the tree ring data suggest it was magnificent very uh, high rainfall and a very long period of no drought years at all in the early 1300s. So it, it was a logical destination for, as, for farmers. Yeah. Wasn't there quite a bit of antelope as part of their whole culture and animal husbandry and their ag agricultural acts too? There's, um, there are a lot of quadrupeds, so sometimes you can say they're antelope, sometimes they look like deer. So the rock art contains a lot of images of four-legged animals. Um, but we don't have much in the way of excavated data to be able to say that uh, how important the, the animals were in their diet. We just don't know. Yeah, it, it, we, we would need a reasonable excavated sample to say what, uh, what animals they relied on. The, um, the uh, envelope are being encouraged out there on that, that landscape today. They don't have so many deer. Yeah? Further south from um, Perry Mesa, you know, this whole complex, there are a number of, I guess, I, hill, hilltop fortification sites. Mm -hmm. And would that have been associated with Perry Mesa or with the Indians in the valley? There are earlier, so, 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 so the, the Perry Mesa influx of, of people um, is occurring after the hill fort period. So, so, so there is a period of all those hill forts, and this uh, is, is after that. All right, well, thank you very much.